All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. <laughs> well, hello and welcome to the Actual Anarchy Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian anarcho capitalist perspective. And tonight is a very special episode that we're going to be doing tonight on They Live, John Carpenter's 1988 cult classic. And we are going to have a, a extremely special guest joining us in a few minutes for the last nighters portion of the show. But before we get to that, Robert, I want to check in with you. We actually had a uh, physical contact this past week. Uh, and as of today, I believe that is in defiance of uh, the, the, the governor's new orders. So that's a bit of a bit of a uh, squeaked it in just uh, in the window there. How you doing, buddy? Yeah. So now they're what? They're strongly encouraging a travel ban and they are strongly encouraging a 14 day quarantine. I'm wondering if this doesn't get resisted, is it then going to progress rather rapidly to a mandatory or is it just a situation where, well, they know they can't actually enforce it. So who knows? But yeah, that was fun to see you in person. It was uh, weird to touch another human being. It was, it was nice. It's always good to see you and your lovely, lovely family. And uh, yeah. Daniel? All right. Well, yes. And also you surprised me by uh, finally paying for something that I had totally forgotten I had sold to you. So um, it's... it's a lessons in time preference, like you paid me the dollar amount from 15 years ago. So it's yes. actually not actually paying me back. But the piece of equipment you purchased is nowhere near the value that you did give me. So it's kind of like chicken egg scenario, I think a little bit. But anyway, uh, I do appreciate that. It was totally unexpected and it will help make uh, Christmas better for the kids, despite the governor trying to cancel Christmas and Thanksgiving here in this state. But anyway, um, I, I think we need to get over to our guest because uh, he only has a limited amount of time and we got to get into this movie. But uh, final word to Robert. Well, that shows how terrible of a friend I am that I only paid you back after 15 years or so. What, I'm not even exactly sure how long it's been, but you're right. There should be some kind of interest charge, which you are gracious enough to not tack on. I don't know what it would be, but uh, no, let's get on to this episode. It should be a good one. All right, I agree. And our special guest will be coming up right after these messages from the last nighters, which of course is uh, us as well. Here you go. Everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Paul Johnson. We are The Last Nighters. You can find us on Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. You can also find us at lastnighters.com and this episode specifically at lastnighters.com slash 150, as this is the 150th episode of our show. And we're going to be doing They Live Tonight with our very special guest. He's here to chew bubblegum and talk about They Live, but he's all out of bubblegum. It's the great Bob Murphy of the Bob Murphy Show. Uh, Bob is a Christian and economist, research assistant professor with the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech, senior fellow of the Mises Institute, and uh, recently, no longer, the former co-host with Tom Woods of the podcast Contra Krugman, and also has his own show, The Bob Murphy Show, on which episode 50, he did They Live. Welcome to the show, Bob. I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. And I really, uh, I'm surprised you went to Times Square there. I can see that behind you, that's your, I guess you're on location. Interesting. That's right. Well, I am using all the technology afforded to me by the free market 
to have a green screen effect behind me. Uh, and because of you know the hidden messaging behind it, if you don't have the glasses on, uh, it's a Galbraithian hellscape of forcing you to do things you wouldn't otherwise do through the power of advertising and propaganda. Right, and it's. I mean, obviously, we're being we're being facetious, but it is it is interesting. I guess if you want to riff on that, there is something to that, right? That it's you know, on the one hand, like even in the worst case scenario, in terms of Galbraith, like it's all they can do is like print suggestions for you and you know try to shape your you know it's in other words that's pretty benign form of totalitarianism right it's the softest <laughs> softest layer but uh anyway welcome welcome to the show and uh is your bio at the bottom of your episodes where i um borrowed that intro from is it still accurate are you still at texas tech or no th th that was yeah th everything was accurate except that so that's the one i do need to fix that so yeah, I I left there at the end of last semester. So as of this point, I'm I'm no longer Texas Tech. Okay, and people can find your show at bobmurphyshow.com, right? Right. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Well, uh, so how we usually start this off is I give a quick read of the Google description, and then I'll go to Robert for his opening take, and we just kind of naturally progress from there. Uh, we start to wind down. We run out of notes, and we give a score. Uh, it might be like pairs of sunglasses out of ten. Um, we can kind of mess around with that, whatever we want to do, but uh, welcome and uh, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence on this very lowbrow show. So you're going to bring some intellectual rigor to the show tonight, I think. I hope not to disappoint. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to bring up the uh, Google description here. So They Live is, uh, of course, John Carpenter uh, came out in 1988, rated R. It's listed as a sci-fi horror, sci horror film, one hour, 37 minutes. And it's a kind of a long one hour, 37 minutes, I felt. Uh, 7.3 IMDb, 86% Rotten Tomatoes, 55% Metacritic. However, 93% of the Google users like it. The description reads, Nada, played by Rowdy Roddy Piper, is a wanderer without meaning in his life. Discovers He discovers a pair of sunglasses capable of showing the world the way it truly is. As he walks the streets of Los Angeles, Nada notices that both the media and the government are comprised of subliminal messages meant to keep the population subdued and that most of the social elite are skull-faced aliens bent on world domination. Wah ha ha ha. With this shocking discovery, not a fights to free humanity from the mind controlling aliens came out November 4th, 1988 director screenplay, etc., all by John Carpenter budget of 4 million box office, 13 million. And it is a cult classic. It's the matrix before the matrix. Uh, and it borrows the matrix borrows a lot from it. Let's go to Robert, uh, my co-host, for your opening information. Well, from John Carpenter, uh, the world famous John Carpenter, who brought us the uh, the Thing, which is one of my all time favorite horror movies, comes this kind of red pill classic kind of inspiring thing before the matrix there was this which is basically telling us that the world is not as it appears uh you know world domination they say that the aliens are here for world domination with the technology they show us in this film it really it doesn't strike me as world domination. It strikes me, and you even say it, that they are like free enterprisers, and I will quibble with that. But for uh, an alien race with the incredible technology that they have, they were there to you know, blend in with society. They were there to kind of protect themselves from the humans finding out about them. But I wouldn't say that they're necessarily dominating and just, you know, control. They're more controlling than like totally taking over the planet or they're taking over the planet in their own special way, I suppose. But they could have easily like militarily taken over, it seemed, with the with the technology that they had. Um, gosh, for the funny thing for me was that for an alien invasion, it sure did seem like just a normal society, like these guys aren't so bad. They're just like normal people that want to live with us. And the worst thing, like you guys were talking about with uh, the Galbraith situation, I mean, how much damage were they really doing? Uh, it, it didn't seem, it seemed to me like the, 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 the nicest, kindest, gentlest alien invasion of all time, honestly. 
Yeah, I, I tend to agree with a lot of that, though. I think they were pointing to or John Carpenter in an interview said that this was his you know, take on Reaganomics because it really upset him. And I, I think that the aliens aren't necessarily to represent the elite or the government or the um, uh, the rich class, the capitalist class, but it's to uh, be a critique of greed itself. Like it's this unfeeling, unthinking, um, imperialistic, uh, exploit all the resources until the environment is destroyed. And so these aliens were actually using the earth uh, to harvest its resources. And they were using the useful idiots of the elite uh, who would work with them in order to accomplish their goal and then leave the earth as this uh, cratering hulk after they've extracted all the resources. So the um, the elite were going along with it because they were greedy and wanted to get rich. And so they were okay with it without realizing that at the end result, they would have a destroyed planet. And I well, think why that's didn't, kind of the narrative that he was going for. Well, why didn't we see some scenes then where the aliens are off, taking all kinds of stuff and just like shipping it out. We didn't, we didn't get any of that. We got some travelers who were beaming around the galaxy or whatever, but all, all I saw were aliens that were shopping, buying, marrying, working but like everybody else. I didn't see any, I mean, there was that one scene where the, the aliens were, were talking to the elites and whatnot and talking about how everybody's getting rich. But how is that? How is that nefarious? I didn't, I didn't cotton on to that aspect. Yeah, I think I was reading into it that, that they were using capitalism as a means by which to be efficiently extracting the resources while keeping the population duped uh, and not understanding it. But the other thing that um, that he brought up was that like the Rust Belt was sort of in the beginning stages there, so. Uh, Frank had lost his job and had moved to Los Angeles. He left his wife and kids back in Detroit. Nada comes from somewhere in the Midwest, goes to Los Angeles looking for work. So they're talking about like poverty being increased because of this quote unquote, you know, Reaganomic voodoo economic trickle down kind of critique that um, I don't think anyone's ever actually said what voodoo economics is or trickle down theory is not an actual theory. I think uh, Milton Friedman maybe talked about that. But anyway, let's get Bob uh, in on the discussion. And Bob, what's your take on the uh, the opening uh, Google information and anything that we've said? Well, sure. So I I just want to mention, I don't know how he did it, but John Carpenter is a marketing genius. You notice how whenever you refer to one of his films, it's John Carpenter's blah, blah, blah. Whereas like I normally, I mean, I don't even say like, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining or so, you know what I mean? Like you just say the name of the title. So I don't know how he pulled that off, but kudos to him. That was a great thing where we, you know, always designate, you know, it's John Carpenter's. Uh, I, I realize if someone else did the thing, then you got to distinguish. But I, to me, it seems like it's more than that. So I don't know where that came from, but that's always, I thought that was a great, however he pulled that off. So like Michael Jackson being the king of pop, I think he just declared that. And then people said, oh, okay. Um, so uh, I, 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 unfortunately guys, I can't remember the exact part, but yeah, I am, virtually certain that the movie is telling us the whole point of it was the aliens were siphoning resources away from earth. But I, I confess, I can't remember like what scene, who said that or what, but it, for whatever reason, that's, that's what I thought the whole point was. And so, yeah, the, the reason for them, you know, being undercover as it were, and then, you know, getting the collaborators, cause I thought that was a big element of it too, to say like the humans who should have known better were selling out, you know, they were traitors to the human race and collaborating with the aliens um, and you know, that presumably reflects upon members of, you know, like, Oh, it's like someone who grew up in a working class thing, but then goes and works for a big corporation and sells out as, you know, the people who are in his neighborhood. I think that's kind of what they were getting at. But, but yeah, the, the idea being rather than having a, an all out war and wiping out 4 billion people or whatever the population was back then, and then extracting the resources, let's just trick, these idiot humans into mining the iron ore and doing whatever else and sending it to us. It, it look how much easier it is to conquer them that way. Sort of like, you know, Alexander the Great or the Roman Empire, like, you know, leaving the local infrastructure and government in place mm -hmm. and just cutting deals with, you know, the local kingpin and saying, we could clearly crush you, just work with us and, you know, we're in charge and, you know, but you can still pretend you're in charge of your own little fiefdom. So th that, that was my take. And so as an economist, 
like it's a cool movie, obviously, and I know we'll come back, you know, we'll give it a rating at the end, but it was very entertaining. I watched it with my son. It still holds up, you know, decades later. My my young teenage son, you know, he didn't get bored. He thought it was a good movie. It was entertaining. But as, as, as an economist, yeah, so this, this species that's so advanced, they can teleport across, you know, thousands of light years. I guess I don't know if they say how far away their home planet is. They can do all that, and yet they need to set up this elaborate scheme because of some little planet around a yellow sun in the Milky Way. You know what I mean? That doesn't, you know what I mean? Like when you see stuff about, oh, there's asteroids that have $4 trillion worth of gold and stuff in them. Like it's, they wouldn't need to go through this elaborate thing to just go get some matter from thousands of light years away because they need it for their own production. Like to me, that's, that's goofy. So the, the, the premise, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think really, really makes sense in terms of, you know, the economics of it. Yeah. And speaking of the economics, wouldn't, if they were just extracting resources all along, wouldn't it eventually at some point get noticed that, hey, we're mining all this ore and gold and silver and everything like that. And it's just disappearing into the ether. It's not going anywhere. It's not going into products. We're not making anything with it. Mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't that be a thing? Like the so, economists would notice? Right. So I think what's happening there is it just is reflecting in, in Daniel. I didn't. I didn't know about those interviews, but that doesn't surprise me that he was using it as a critique of Reaganomics. Like that totally fits in with, you know, what I had guessed he was doing with this movie. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I think like they just, someone coming from the left doesn't have a very good knowledge of economics. And so, yeah, in their point, they say, well, well, sure. Right, Robert, that is true. Just like, don't we notice when we outsource and all these manufacturing jobs disappear? Like, isn't there a, you know, giant sucking sound as Ross Perot would say going, you know what I mean? In other words, they would point to it or, maybe a better analogy or, or illustration of the kind of thing he has in mind is right in the real world. There are like, you know, multinational energy companies that will cut a deal with like some African government and just, you know, really aggressively mine the, the resources in an area and like the local villagers, the river gets polluted or they might literally be, you know, forced into you could arguably call it slave labor and stuff. So there are, Activist groups do say stuff like that, and people can you know look in and see you know how how valid are those allegations. But there is a lot of stuff right now going on where you know some big company will go to some place and, and just strip mine it, and, and if the local government's corrupt and just they you know they get a piece of the action, they turn a blind eye to you know clear abuse of the of the local peasants kind of thing. So you know maybe he they have in mind something like that as well. Yeah, that's our episode on Blood Diamond, everyone. The, oh, the movie? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen Blood Diamond? It's basically uh, that. Right. I, mean, I, I know of it, but no, I don't, I don't think I saw it. So I, I know what you're talking about, but yeah. Okay. It's got Leo. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Robert, um, I felt like this was the, when we were growing up, you know, the left the progressive type were the arbiters of, you know, um, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and all of those things. And, and they viewed the conservative values as being the ones in, trying to impose their values on others and restrict, uh, censor, and all of those things. And my, how the tables have turned. Because back then, and this is maybe an example of it, this is the left speaking truth to power. But now it's been revealed that that was merely a tactic for them to acquire the power themselves, uh, which is what the aliens would represent. And now uh, that they're in the positions of power and influence, they have now begun to silence truth and dissent. Um, so do you see that this movie viewed today maybe is viewed differently than the intention or the original viewing way back when? Yeah, I, I to, to Bob's point in his podcast, he was talking about how the, the messaging of the aliens were either rang true or did not, like with the, the work, obey, stuff like that. That all rang very true, but the get married and reproduce, not so much, especially today with the war on the family and that sort of thing. But yeah, growing up in the 80s with the kind of uh, cultural, I don't even know how to exactly explain it. But yeah, I remember being a young lefty and feeling like the right was kind of imposing its values on us. There's a lot of pressure to get married, have kids be one of us, that kind of thing. So then to, to, to 15 year old Robert or whenever, however old I was when I first saw this film, this movie did ring true, but today you're absolutely right. It's, it's very, it's a very different takeaway. 
Right. And, and for the imperialist conquest kind of narrative we were talking about of exploiting all the resources, if you're the aliens, you want to promote uh, the obedient workers, right? You want your ant colony to grow and be able to exponentially extract these resources. You don't need to spend as much time on this planet. You can move off uh, to uh, extract from other other planets. So in the space of the film, I can see the Marian reproduce working at the time and also being a narrative against uh, conservative culture and conservative values way back when. But now it's uh, now, you know, it's a very anti family uh, position uh, from the left. Yeah. Yeah. You would want more tax cattle to farm, I would think. Yes. Yeah, so you guys, you, yeah, if it just come, you guys are raising a good point. That, so you're, you're right, Robert, in my, when I did my analysis of it, that was the, the big thing that I said in terms of the, you know, when the when he puts on the thing and, and sees the stuff that, um, that didn't ring true to me to say marry and reproduce because yeah, nowadays they don't uh, foster that. But I guess in fairness, if John Carpenter, he, in other words, we're looking at it as Rothbardians or whatever, and looking at the power elites and the, you know, the globalist as Alex Jones might say, and what are they trying to trick the mass into doing? But yet John Carpenter, if he's recoiling against in his mind, it's, it's, you know, the Reagan cabal, that are the ones taking over and, and you know running roughshod over traditional you know society coming from the right if that's what you know what he sees the threat as then yeah i could see why he would say oh yeah just go get married have, you know pay no attention to the man behind the, the curtain just go you know have kids and whatever and you know you're too busy bringing your kids to soccer to pay attention to uh you know iran contra you know that's right so I right yeah see how where he's coming from with, with that and also too as someone a critic of mine pointed out after my episode was saying, no, if, if all you want to do is keep the masses, you know, from revolting, you know, just keep them pacified. Um, other things equal, you could see how like people who are married and have kids are less likely to pull up, you know, to take up arms against the government. Whereas, you know, you got 20 million guys who, you know, can't get married or whatever, and they got nothing to do. A bunch of testosterone. Exactly. They yeah, might they start shooting stuff up. Right. When you got kids, you got, you got more to lose. You're less likely to take those risks. Right. Yeah. Like I'll go to the grocery store. I'll put on a mask just to not be hassled, not to be confronted by someone, even though I am opposed to the concept of it. I don't think that there is uh, sufficient scientific evidence to mandate anything. And in my argument, and, and I actually, uh, not to derail us into this virus discussion, but I really enjoy your take, Bob, about, um, the climate change argument where you basically take the IPCC paper and mm -hmm. you say, even with given the numbers, you know, here's why you're still wrong. And, and here's why you'd want to advance technology to the point to where you could overcome this. And mm -hmm. that was uh, my take since March has been with the virus, no matter how dangerous, even if it is the most dangerous virus ever, you want to have your most productive technological capability, productive capacity, all of these things with which to fight this virus. You want to have mm -hmm. people boosting their immune system, getting exercise, getting good nutrition. You don't want to like destroy the structure of production and, and make it hard for people to get even, uh, you know, sufficient nutrition, like 130 million children might starve to death according to the UN, right? Something like that. Um, so that's, that's my take on your take of the climate change argument, but as applied to the virus. So it's, uh, what, what do I want to call that? It's a, I, it's a, it's a Murphy argument. Uh, I wrote it down. It was a modified Murphy. Yeah, that's what I call it. Modified Murphy. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I mean, it was, since we're riffing on it, one last thing too about the mask. As I pointed out, so yeah, I wear a mask also because I have someone in my household who is really, you know, at, at risk. And so I really want to make sure I don't accidentally catch this thing and bring it home. Um, and I'm against mask mandates. Number one, just philosophically, you know, my ethical system you know, it's, you, you can't violate property rights, even if you have good intentions, but also if there's a, if there's a mask man, that means when I go to the store now, most of the people who are shopping with me aren't taking it seriously. They, they, you know, they just have like their shirt up over their face or they got, you know, because they're only doing it because they're forced to wear if there were no mandate and the, and the, the rule was just, yeah, businesses can set whatever policies they want. Then maybe one store in every city would say, you know, we're being, having a mask policy. And so only people who would go there would be the ones who really were trying to be careful and they would have you know, no yeah. masks and whatever. And everybody else would just go to the other stores where there was no policy. Whereas right now, you know, we're all kind of forced into the same boat. And so it's even on its own terms, like you say, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, work.
So yeah, the one size fits all policy making of government fails again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And just to riff a little bit further on your point, and that, that's a great point. I, I hadn't considered that before, but they've also reduced the number of locations you can even go to. So like all mm-hmm. the mom and pops, you can't really shop at. It's just mm-hmm. the bigger stores. So they're corralling people into yeah. these uh, Petri dishes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With reduced service times. So everybody yeah. has to go during those times. Right. And that's, yeah, they do that too. Uh, like with the, at least the, the, the big city that I'm near with the like subway public transit, right. The so-called public transit, you know, government transit where they're reducing like how many trains run and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, so now you're cramming people into, and, and they're, they're not even, do, they're not doing it just because all oh, the workers schedules. I mean, they're, they're ostensibly saying we're doing this in order to limit the exposure, but no, you're just now cramming everybody into the subways, into the reduced number of, of uh, trips or whatever. So that's wh- how is that minimizing the spread? Right. Yeah. It's yeah. unintended consequences. <laughs> they try to try to fix something and they actually, actually make it worse. Uh, you know, another thing, Bob, that you mentioned on your episode, uh, episode 50 of your show and can people go to Bob, Bob Murphy show.com slash 50 to get there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, you talk about how Rowdy Rowdy Piper, he makes this drastic turn, like almost immediately from being this naive, happy, go along, get along guy to seeing the, the aliens and like starting to kill them. Uh, but that what he's doing is actually going to inti- incite a response from the alien overlords who have massive technological uh, superiority over the humans. So it's an example of blowback but uh, even more so. So, I mean, they're going to quell that rebellion, I think, pretty quickly. And they actually do that to a point when they raid the church and they uh, knock down the homeless encampment. And then they go to that meeting that night. And um, I guess they have a collaborator, the the um, the newswoman. She, mm-hmm. I guess she tipped them off. Uh, so she's the woman in red, Robert, from The Matrix, I think, in the, in the, the simulation. The Matrix is a ripoff of They Live, all right? I said it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but anyway, I thought that that was a really good point because, um, you know, as much as you want to um, resist things like this, uh, you have to be as smart about it. Right. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you go the road route of violence, like um, what is it, John Lennon quote, like flick your face, flick you in the nose, try to get you into violence because they know how to handle you when mm-hmm. you're violent. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what Rowdy Roddy Piper's doing here. And he's going to get uh, a response that's going to make it even harder for them to get a true resolution to the situation. Yeah, so it was one of my prouder titles. The, the, my episode title was Why Roddy Piper Was Too Rowdy and They Live, uh, for folks who want to look that up. So, yeah, it was um, – right, my basic argument was the, w- the way the movie works – you know, he, he comes in and, and yeah, it, it, even though it's the classic scene about the I'm here to chew bum, bubble gum and so on. It, it it escalated quickly. Like he's just all of a sudden in the bank and looking around and then all of a sudden decides I'm going to just start shooting people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And as I pointed out, for one thing, he doesn't know, like for all he knows, some of those aliens are actually pro-human and they're doing what they can, you know, on the inside to try to say, hey, maybe we should give, you know, more re- rights to these humans or, you know what I mean? Whereas he's just, just like, oh, if I see aliens, I'm I'm shooting them. You know what I mean? So there, there's that element too, that, that that's kind of a, an aggressive approach. But beyond that, just big picture strategically. Yeah. The way the movie presents itself is you think that, ah, yes, at the very end, finally he comes and he smashes the thing. And then, you know, it ends with all the people seeing the aliens for who they are. And it leads you to believe that's it. You know, he saved the day he freed humanity. And and what I argued is no, given that the rest of this movie was true up to that point, And that that's how reality was. They would easily reassert domination so like you say, for one thing, if it came to just an all out war, given their technology, they could certainly slaughter millions of people before we could do anything about it. But even beyond that, they wouldn't need to. They would just go ahead and fix that you know, broadcast thing. You know, the, the aliens would go into hiding or something when they realized that technology was off and, pe- and the humans could see them for who they were. They would you know, all go into hiding. They would reestablish that thing, let's say, whatever, 48 hours later, and then they would all come out as humans again. And just, you know, they would come up with some bogus story mm-hmm. to explain, oh, no, um, there was this chemical thing and it got released and it caught, you know, and they would trot out 100 PhD scientists from MIT and, you know, Harvard to explain, ah, yes, you see, the neurotransmitters were briefly interrupted for that period back last Thursday. And, da, 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 you know, and even the vice president would be joking around like, yeah, I was with the commander in chief and 
I saw this reptile. Whoa. And then, but you know, someone said, and so they would explain it all away. And really is all of humanity just going to say, no, we think we've been infested by humans because for a brief window there, a bunch of us thought we saw lizard people. No, they would all just say, oh, okay. That's the official explanation. And you'd go back to your daily life. Like, right. So it, my wife, it wouldn't even have worked. So he did all that. And then, you know, it, it, he died or whatever it, and it, for, for nothing that that would not have actually shattered the illusion. Um, just like now, like, look, in, in our life, I w- you would think if the New York Times has a front page article saying President Obama has a secret kill list of people who can be taken out without a court, that we win. Haha, ha, look at it. We, we've pulled it off. Everyone can now see them for what they are. Nobody cared. That was a real thing. The New York Times did run such a story saying president has a secret kill list and nobody cared. So, you know, they, <laughs> go look it up, folks. You don't even catch that. So it doesn't matter. They, um, so last thing, and I, what I did say is I, I wasn't just advocating fatalism, but no, I like what they were doing in the underground movement, like mass producing those, those goggles and like maybe trying to figure out the technologies or is there some other way? So you can certainly you know, do what you can to slowly wake people up in, in pockets and whatever and gradually, but in terms of just a one shot, like, oh, we, we knocked down that transmitter and now we're all free because we all see the truth that no, the aliens had done a great job blending in and, and the it, it's too hard for people to switch like that. Like it, it's right. a gradual yeah. thing, you know, like like to red pill them or to wake them up, whatever metaphor you want to use. It, it's a gradual thing and only certain people are even receptive to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shock to the system, especially to the NPC style mind. Like Michael Malice brings this up a lot of time. Like there's so many people who operate within that environment to where even if exposed to truth or revealed truth or whatever, they're going to totally ignore it or just excuse it away. Uh, and you, your episode came out, what, almost a year and a half, two years ago. It's almost um, like you're a Nostradamus, you know, very prescient because the examples you cite, yes, they're very good, like the Obama kill list and like the JFK assassination. But if anything, the last eight or nine months here with this uh, COVID thing has just vindicated you entirely in your argument. Like people are almost allergic to good news related to this thing. I think Tom brings it up uh, in each one of his uh, very excellent um, COVID talks. You know, it's like people are impervious to good news. Uh, they want to see the fear. And yeah. then yeah, for me, for me, the biggest thing, and I'm not saying anything profound here, but the most shocking thing was, you know, when it, it was, Hey, you can't do anything. You're killing grandma. Da, 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 if you go out, can't even go to a funeral, you know, your funeral has to be, you know, two people showing up, that kind of stuff. And then with the George Floyd stuff and all the mass protests, it wasn't merely that the public health, so-called public health experts weren't sticking their neck out and saying, hey, these BLM activists shouldn't be doing that. It was that they were signing public statements saying, oh, racism is such, is itself such a threat to public health that this is okay. You know what I mean? In other words, like they were just totally showing that their credentials meant nothing. This had nothing to do with medical or at least the medical science stuff could easily be trumped by politics if it was politics they agreed with or if they if they were going to be put in an awkward position and didn't want to get yelled at by you know the anti-racism activists or something so right. yeah to me that was just i if i were doing a novel my villains would have been better and less transparent than this like it's just it's it's amazing how much they openly say and no like i say barely you know nobody cares or at least you know the resistance cares but it's it's again it's not a mass that's what I'm getting at is in the movie, they lead you to believe, Oh, surely if everyone saw that there were actual alien lizard people running the show, then there would be a mass up. And I'm saying, no, there wouldn't, there would be right. people re- ripping on them as oh, you're alien truthers. Ha ha. You know, or, or, or we've been infiltrated by aliens. Okay. Alex Jones, whatever. Or they'd make it political and like, Oh no, those are only the evil Republicans that think that, or that sort of thing. Yeah. Right, yeah, and we're seeing right, that with yeah. the, uh, or, the election. Hey, lizard people are people too, and let's not discriminate <laughs> against them. Yeah. That, that's that's homo, uh, homo sapienism or something. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And, and Robert, we've pointed out many times on the show in the past that uh, people who are in this kind of NPC mode or, or, or whatever don't care that they're holding two completely illogical positions at the same time. The cognitive cognitive dissonance does not bother them in the slightest. So even when being confronted with this, uh, Bob, to your point, yeah, they just don't care. They'll just yeah. continue on. Now in the movie though, I, 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 I do sympathize with Rowdy. I mean, he isn't the smartest guy. He's just kind of on this trip where he ultimately 
is blowing up this satellite, which I agree mm -hmm. with you, Bob. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous idea that this super advanced alien force would create one weak point. Like, oh, yeah, Death, yeah. Death Star in, weak uh, spot. in the, the last uh, Star Wars movie, there was just the one tower that suspended mm -hmm. the, the whole <laughs> fleet. You know, it's yeah. just always it's aliens. They just like doing this thing where you just touch one thing and it's all over. <laughs> you have redundant systems all over the place. But, in a free market. <laughs> but I think ultimately, though, wouldn't it? I mean, if you do build up this resistance force, ultimately, eventually you're going to get found out. You know, it's going to get exposed and there uh, there would be an armed conflict. And, you know, I've used many arguments saying that even though you're vastly outpowered technologically, if you are the home team, you do have that tenacious reason to fight. So the reason why the Vietnamese and the, you know, the Afghanis have been able to, even though I would say that it's not, those aren't necessarily wars that were ever intended to be won. I would still say that they did remarkably well with the vastly inferior technology that they had compared to the invaders. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, I guess, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I didn't make an argument, let alone prove in my analysis of that film that it would never be appropriate to take up arms against the alien invaders. My point was simply Rowdy Piper, you know, acted too soon. Like that particular thing was reckless. And by the way, I'm not being a complete stick in the mud. Yeah, watching the movie, I'm totally rooting for him too. It was only even after the fact that I kind of was like, you know, thinking about yeah. it, really that wouldn't have worked in, you know, but. But yeah, obviously in the movie, like, yeah, yeah, break that thing. All right, Roddy, yeah, you know, that's awesome. So um, it's, but but it's also analogous to, and that's partly why I did it in terms of activism right now. So it's a kind of thing where clearly right now, if all the Rothbardians tried to, you know, have a revolution, they would get snuffed out. There's there's no way. And so my point is, okay, so right now, well, you just, you know, teach people more and more about, look at what a free society would look like. Can we all at least agree? We don't know how we're going to get there, but that, that would be better than the current system. And just more and more people. But my point was, if you're able to go from 1% of the population believing that to 2%, well, then just keep doing that, right? And so it would get to the point where if, if most of the people, even in the army and the police and whatever agreed, then, you know, it's like, to me, the best thing in the world would not be like some sort of libertarian uh, Nuremberg trial where we take over and then we, it would just be like whoever the president, you know, Biden is in the white house and he's barking orders at people. And they're like, nah. And they just, just ignore him. He's just some crazy old man in, in this building thinking he's the president. And really it's like some guy thinking right. he's, you know, Napoleon and nobody is what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> this crazy scenario that I'm, I'm painting. So yeah, that's that, what happened with Ceausescu, right? I, I don't know enough about that. I mean, I, I think so, but I don't, I really don't know enough about that to say, but so like this, the Soviet union, like people would have thought in 1984 or let's say 1985, I'm not making a, a reference to the novel in the actual year, 19, people would have thought there was going to, you know, the only way the Soviet union is going to go down, if there's some huge conflict and all, oh, man, I hope too many people don't die in the nuclear Holocaust. And no, it just kind of, you know, collapsed. And I, and I've read things on that and was saying, yeah, the reason it collapsed was because even the members of the communist party stopped believing in it. Like they realize this just this is a terrible system, and so they kind of just with. So I'm saying, if you could educate enough people that way, that would work. But you're you're right. Like it's I I didn't make it the strong case that it would be necessary. So in the in the context of the film, if more and more of humanity realized who they were, it's you know they could stop collaborating, whatever. And ultimately, I don't remember if I made this point in the film, but if it's a kind of thing, all right, you guys have super cool technology. You want our resources. You don't need to dupe us and, you know, lie and whatever, maintain this system of oppression. Why don't you show us your tractor beam tech or your teleportation technology and we'll give you half of our crude oil? Like, that's a fair trade. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, I was all on board with it. Why are you guys just trading openly? You guys obviously mm -hmm. have massive value to offer and we have something to offer to you. So let's just make that deal. I, it seemed like a no brainer. Right. Yeah. And, and to bring up a point you brought up earlier, Bob, um, if we have an awareness of an asteroid that has $4 trillion worth of resources on it, and maybe they're not aware of that for some reason, 
like, hey, you don't need to exploit our resources. Look, there's this thing over here. No one's mm -hmm. living there. You got the technology. Mm -hmm. Go get it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose, thing. yeah, I suppose though, like somebody in fairness, John Carpenter, his thing could push back and say, okay, well, if you guys are right then with your analysis and there's no reason for the aliens to infiltrate and, and exploit us, then why is there exploitation right now in the real world? Right? Like what, why don't, why don't the elites just say, Hey, we're real smart. And so in a free market, we'd earn a high salary because we're so smart. And instead of, you know, setting up the Bilderberg group to dominate you, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess you, you, you could, we, we do need to explain that. Like what did, did, in other words, did we just prove that no one would ever exploit anybody? Presumably not because exploitation does happen. Well, only with a government enforcing it. Right. So it's like a, a form of protectionism, like the, those with entrenched interest in power will acquire uh, and well, advocate right. for more questions that they can comply with that others can't to Prohibit well, right, but I'm saying, but Robert and I kind of were just there saying, basically, why would the aliens even bother to set up this system of oppression, like like set up a little mini government or something, or behind the scenes? Why wouldn't they just say, "Hey, here we are. We've got this stuff. You've got that stuff. Let's make a deal." And so, you know, oh, gee, if if the you know Alex Jones is right and the members of the CFR are really out to get us, why don't they just say what you know what they want and we'll just we'll trade and have voluntary trade? So I, I guess their part of it is like subjugation of others is part of the the goal like like they want power for its own sake and so you know i don't know if the aliens get get a, a thrill from knowing that they kind of have taken over a planet well john carpenter would say it's just business they're just free marketers and that's how free markets work right with the cfr and the bilderberg group and uh the government you know and offering this protectionism right, like right that's literally how they how they view this stuff like um we've made this point many times is that the left is often okay with um, identifying a bad situation, but their prescriptions for correcting it is just more of the thing that caused it. Right. Yeah. Like I used to say when I would wrote, so I have a book on like the state of the economics of the healthcare system and what it's called the primal prescription. If people want to look at it and I co-authored it with an ER doctor. Um, but yeah, it's when I got into that stuff, I realized there were a lot of like people on the road, like Newt Gingrich types saying as of 2007, oh no, we got the greatest healthcare system in the world and don't listen to these Democrats who want to mess with it. And I, because no, there's seriously messed up stuff with the way healthcare was being delivered and paid for in the United States. It's just, we would all agree that's not the free market. It's because there's so much government intervention and regulation and subsidies and blah, 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 that that's why it's such a screwed up market. But yeah, it's people on the right who are just, nope, nope, that's capitalism. That's how it works when no, that's not capitalism. So you're right. The, the left is good at identifying certain things as being crazy. It's just, yeah, what, what, what their, what their diagnosis is and prescription is, is clearly wrong in our view. Right. And then when someone like Newt Gingrich says, Oh, that's the free market or we have the best system because it's free market, then that gives them something to point to be like, look, look, that's free market. And they right. can ignore every other, uh, counterpoint of evidence and not that they'd care anyway I, I, i'm i'm convinced they do not care about evidence when it comes down to it no it's a religious belief right yeah i agree with you guys and it's it, what's come out more clearly to me you know say what you will about the trump years but i think he got the left to kind of pull the mask off and to be clear about this is who we are um that it's it's they hate rich people it's not that we want the money to pay for soup kitchens or whatever or fun food stamps. It is the idea that there's someone out there who's a billionaire is offensive and that needs to be stopped. And, oh yeah, if we can take the money and do something to go with it, fine. But no, the goal is there should not be billionaires. I mean, I'm not putting words millionaires, on Millionaires are okay now. Millionaires are okay. I wrote a book. What? I wrote a book. Right. People, <laughs> people buy my book. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Robert, do you have any notes that you want to get into before we start to wind this one down? I know that we uh, we're getting close to the amount of time. Yeah, yeah. No, I got a couple of things here. I don't know how much time we're going to have, but um, one thing that just occurred to me while you guys were talking. Uh, speaking of Trump, I, I'm surprised there isn't like a meme of Trump's head over Rowdy Rowdy Piper's, like at the end after he blows up the dish and then he flips off the helicopter. It's like. 
Trump is really is this that big middle finger to the mm. lying media, and that just seems like a natural fit. But uh, in terms of the film itself, I did have one big note, and I know that this isn't anywhere near what our discussion has been so far. But every once in a while, we like to talk about uh, you know the acting, the directing, the story, the plot, that kind of thing. And one spot bugged me, so the the two main characters they figure out he finally they have this big brawl in the street and Super they finally long. yeah it's really long it just goes on and on and on it's like rowdy let's use your wrestling expertise and let's let's map out this big long fight that takes like 10 minutes ultimately he puts on the head the 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 sunglasses and he's like oh man this is crazy and so then they're sitting in this hotel room and they're like, well, what do we got to do? We got to we gotta find the people that, you know, they're taking Bob's advice. We got to find the people that made these sunglasses. There's other people that know. So let's go out and let's find those people. Cut to scene of the two main guys just drinking beer in their apartment or in their <laughs> hotel room. And then they're just, just sitting around, hanging out. And then... They're walking, he's walking up, he goes and gets some groceries or something, and he just happens to be walking through the lobby hotel, of the hotel. And then one of them finds our protagonist. So this is a situation where your protagonist should be out going and solving problems and being active and doing things instead of, oh, here's the solution. They found us. It just, it was super lazy. I hated it. I want the protagonists to figure things out and go and find them. That would have been way more interesting than to just sit there where they are drinking beer and, oh, there's the solution right there. They found us. That was just really bad and dumb. So <laughs> Did my... they accurately characterize the libertarian movement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll at least what we do. Complain. We'll sit back and complain, and then we'll have the solution thrust drink, upon us drink beer and do other yeah. stuff yeah um yeah yeah that was yeah you're right i had forgotten about how long that fight scene was and that was kind of good like i didn't know what what function that was serving except like oh well we got to have some action here um i i noticed too i don't know what like it seems like john carpenter likes real brawny leads like in big trouble little china he's got kurt russell and you know it's a real and at the end of that too notice there wasn't the romantic thing like at the end of big trouble in little china you know like the the is, is he going to hook up with the um green the girl girl? in the city yeah i forget what her name is the actress um right and he's like no and he just goes he gets back in his truck and hey there i'm going to you know and he's doing his thing because like and, and the same thing here like it's um you know he always oh, he and the, she i mean she ends up being a collaborator and that's why it doesn't work out obviously but anyway i, I did notice it does seem like he's really big into strong you know uh hunky guys who are so they're, they're so good, like even no woman's good enough for him. Like that's it's an interesting thing that seems to be in some of his movies. Um, yeah, I mean it was very entertaining. It's you're right. It was. I think they they were trying though, like to, like to with the with the the resistance and you know and the, how there was the stuff over the TV in the beginning. So they they were trying to show that yeah, there's this thing for those who have the ears to hear it. And any guy, so I, it did carry my interest. Like I said, I my young son was was watching it and he didn't get bored so i mean that that is something there is something to be said for that in terms of the quality of the of the film but but yeah it was the the bank scene like i said even though that's the, the quintessential classic scene that was funny how like he just went from all of a sudden he's being chased you know what i'm just gonna start shooting people that that did seem like it, it escalated quickly yeah, yeah he, and he's firing a shotgun into like a crowd. <laughs> Those things at that range are going to have a massive spread. You're hitting everybody, basically. Right, I know right. it's the magic of Hollywood, and he's only hitting the perfect targets he wants to hit. But realistically, yeah, you're a, you're a madman just opening fire into a crowd. And they're missing him uh, every right. time. Right. His every plot time. armor is super thick in this film. There's even that scene at the end where he's in the alleyway, and they're like spraying machine gun bullets, right, and he's right. they're up on the roof. They got a perfect angle on him, and there he's just like, "Well, I can't be hit. I'm the I'm the I'm the hero." We yeah, talking about? Yeah. And he's got yeah. unlimited ammo too. Like that that's that's the uh, assault rifle that they want to ban, right? The one that has unlimited ammo, <laughs> Rambo style. Right, right. <laughs> yep. But I, I will no. say, I mean, actually, it's even though that was the classic line about the chewing bubble gum. Actually, I should say the classic thing that everyone remembers is putting the glasses on and then looking up and seeing 
you know, the build, the stuff that's behind you right now, Daniel, you know, that thing, that's the classic. So in terms of just, you know, sort of like 1984, even for people who haven't read it, they know, oh yeah, Big Brother is watching you or something. You know what I mean? Like everyone knows that. Everybody knows that they, oh yeah, you put the glasses on and you can see. So, I mean, in terms of just that element is a, a contribution to, you know, film lore, but also like political discussions that you, know, you can't, you can't take that away from them. That was an, an amazing idea to, you know, to get across, just to say, oh, you're able to see through, you know, the, the propaganda. Right. Now, do you think that that's something that could be viewed by, by different people as meaning different things to them? Like, oh, if you could only see things my way, then you have the glasses. So like for me, it's like if you could see things through a Rothbard and a narco capitalist perspective, then you can see the things through this perspective. But a progressive might say the same thing about, you know, being woke or something like that. Like the Matrix is kind of like that, too, where people right. who are viewing yeah. it can interpret it in different ways and say, oh, this totally supports my position. And uh, so, you know, if only you took that red pill, you'd see things that, you know, Biden's actually a great guy or whatever. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point that, you know, what what somebody like a Michael Miles or something means by being red pilled is totally different from, you know, probably what the creators of the Matrix intended. And so uh, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, what they're obviously getting at is just there's a superficial, you know, there's a facade that's being presented to the masses. So I think everybody can acknowledge. It. I mean, nobody likes Biden. That even like we watch just to, to keep tabs on them. You know, my wife and I have YouTube channels where we follow people on the left. They can't stand it. Like their point is, yeah, we had to knock out Trump. Now we'll consolidate. You know, among the progressives, they can't stand Democrats calling for unity. Like, why would I have unity with all these racist KKK people? No, let's let's you know, purge them. And so it's um, like everybody can agree the narrative that's the official thing that's reported on CNN or Fox is bogus. But you're right. What they think the real truth is would be also vastly different. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned, um, you know, that, that the leftists you see are not fans of Biden. I'm infected with being close to Seattle and knowing people from Seattle I, on their Facebook posts. As long as I'm still there, I'm, I'm in a, on a limited uh, status right now. Like I might get kicked off any minute, mm -hmm. but they actually love the guy. They're like, oh, this is so amazing. Love one. You know, Biden's great. Kamala's amazing. And I've been trying to drop uh, red pill, uh, breadcrumb seeds with with one of my buddies. And for years, you know, I've been dri dripping stuff to him. And sometimes it seems like he gets it. And then. The next time I engage with him, he's like totally blue pilled again. It's so bizarre. But he's like, oh, yeah, Trump's such a racist or whatever. And Biden's so great. I hope you voted for Biden. And I'm like, well, number one, I don't vote. I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. But number two, how can you trust that Biden is any better? Like, look at this terrible thing, this terrible thing, this terrible thing. And then same thing with uh, Harris. And it's like he doesn't care. You know, just it's willful really ignorance. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I, I guess there must be plenty of Democrats who like who do believe, but I'm saying people on the left and I, you know, I can't speak to your particular friends, but the ones I've, it'd be sort of like people on the right, not really thinking that John McCain, you know, is, is represents anarcho-capitalism or so, you know what I mean? Like it's, right. or, or like Mitt Romney versus whoever, like, yeah, maybe that you would have had a mild preference for that, but it's not that Mitt Romney really, you know, it represents the ideals, even for a minarchist, let alone, you know, an ANCAP person. Yeah, I think general blue pill Democrats like Biden more than absolutely the the extreme progressive left. They probably can't stand the guy. Yeah, it makes sense but. to me. And and it's it's also funny that uh, you know there's all this censorship and things happening, but then uh, like you were saying, Bob, he goes to the um, unity message, and they're all like, "No, we're making lists." Right. <laughs> if you supported Trump or voted for him or whatever, you're not going to be able to be in good standing in society. You're not gonna be able to get a job. We're going to ostracize you. You know, it's like, it's like chaos theory, but in uh, a bastardized uh, upside down world version. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, I almost I respect, respect your book, of course. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I know. I almost respect them because like, they're being consistent. In other words, it is kind of weird that you spend four years demonizing these people as being, you know, Trump's the next Hitler, his supporters, you know, love having children in cages on the border and all this stuff. And then you're going to have unity with them and reach across the aisle. Like that is kind of a disconnect. So it is almost like, yeah, if you actually believed your rhetoric, you should be making lists of these people. So I understand why they're doing it. It's just not saying, well, it's because you're, you're wrong. Like 
you know, just stop. And if, if, if your worldview is leading you to believe, no, we have to eliminate half the country because they're monsters. Like maybe something's wrong with your worldview. Yeah. Yeah. They're pulling like straight out of Mao's playbook. You know, <laughs> they sounded pretty, uh, pretty scary to me, but what's, what's freaky to me is I've been, you know, making references to the French revolution for obvious reasons. Like, and I, what I wasn't expecting is I kind of assumed everybody would say, oh yeah, we know they went too far in the French revolution, but we're not going to make that mistake. No, they're like, yeah, French revolution was awesome. What's your point? And there's, <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw on Twitter, I, I reposted it. There's a, a, a progressive group on Facebook that has 79,000 followers. You know, so it's not some little isolated thing. And their actual logo is a guillotine that says 2020. And it's got like the Democrat slogan or whatever. Oof. Like I'm not like for real. Like and they're not they're not banned, right? Like they're, they're actually advocating yeah. for violence. Jeez, isn't that promoting violence, huh? So, so. yeah, it's uh, it, it is a clown world. That is uh, that's for sure. I don't know where things are, are headed. Um, it makes me nervous. I, I'm worried about the the world my kids are growing up in, uh, and all that. But anyway, uh, we we should start to wind this one down. And I hope you can stick around for a little bit um, afterward for. Uh, that final portion we were talking about earlier. But um, Robert, why don't you lead us off with your final summary and review and give me a number of sunglasses out of 10 for your score. Yeah, so John Carpenter's They Live. Classic, uh, I don't know if you'd call this a horror film. It's more of an action dystopia type film. Uh, yeah, but like Bob was saying earlier, he has there's something about the brilliance of the film that does fit into the zeitgeist. People know it. It is out there. You can reference it and they know what you're talking about, even if they've never seen the film, which is, you know, an achievement. Absolutely. And it's also the kind of art that people from all over the political spectrum can point to and feel like they are the hero and that they are seeing things that other people cannot see. And if only they could show them their truth. So yeah, I, this is the kind of movie that has long lasting wide appeal to pretty much anybody. They can put themselves in the shoes of the person that has that secret knowledge. And that only if they could explain it to someone else, then make them see as they do. Uh, you know, it, it gives you that sense of being a hero. And uh, yeah, for that reason alone, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta score this positively. But above and beyond that, it is. It's a good. It's a good movie. It's a lot of fun. It um, it's slow in the right areas, and by saying the right areas, like it takes time to breathe. It's not just pure action all the time, like never slowing down. You, you get a sense like there's this one scene when he first puts on the sunglasses and he is just kind of stumbling around in a daze as you would be right. Your world has just been shocked and you are just, Whoa, what? No way. And he takes the sunglasses off. He puts them back on, takes the sunglasses off, puts them back. And he's perhaps just being a bit too obvious about it because the aliens kind of key get cop to what he's, what he's actually looking at. But it, it was a nice scene for me because it, it rang true. It was like, yeah, that's exactly what would happen. If all of a sudden you saw the world radically different, like, you took DMT and you're seeing aliens all over the place. You're like, whoa. So, uh, you know, John Carpenter, he's a talented guy. Um, he didn't write this script, but I'm sure he had a fair amount of input. Um, having Rowdy Roddy Piper, the professional wrestler as your lead is a strange thing. He probably worked cheap. They only made the movie for only $3 million. So, you know, he, I think he did a perfectly fine job. He's not like a professional trained actor type guy, but he's got the physicality and he did good enough, right? Um, the Holly character, I thought was just this weird stone faced lady. I didn't understand her as an actress. Um, it was just, she was just like a, a robot. I, I didn't quite understand uh, what he was going for with that. Um, and when she turns to be on um, the collaborator side at the end, you're like, yeah, 
yeah, because she's got the dead eyes. I don't understand why why that was a shock. But um, no, no, this is a lot of fun. I I I want to give it like eight sunglasses, but it's it's probably not that good. I'll, I'll have to give it seven sunglasses out of ten, and uh, recommend it for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, just don't go in expecting like you know the greatest movie ever made, but as a excellent concept piece from um you know a talented guy making an interesting statement and uh yeah it's not entirely without flaw of course like anything but for what their budget was and what the cast was man yeah they made something really 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 good here All right. Well, thank you for that, Robert. And uh, so it's seven sunglasses out of 10 for you. And regarding the uh, screenplay or the writer, um, it's actually a pseudonym. Uh, I, I was looking at some behind the scenes stuff and apparently Carpenter uh, did write oh. it and he had some con contributors as well. So that's why he used a pseudonym for it. Oh, okay. So, well, then even more props to the guy then. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty solid. Uh, Bob, how about your uh, final summary and your number of sunglasses? Sure. So you're going to think I'm just copying but what i agree with everything robert just said and i was torn like i wanted to give it an eight just because it was so classic but then because of the like you go look at some like like all about eve or something i mean there's some really old movies that are just amazing like everything about them and so i i guess i would have to just give it a, a seven but one thing that we haven't touched on uh, you, you guys got it a little bit but i just wanted to make clear is i really liked how in the beginning of the movie and, and i think yeah roddy piper like just casting him was a brilliant move like who would have thought of doing that and well, John Carpenter, that's the answer. Um, and that was a great, it was a great choice. I think he did a great job, you know, given what it was and just made the movie. But in the beginning, like it's, they really have him, you know, when, when the other people are complaining and he's just, I forget his exact words, but he's definitely saying, no, man, I believe in America. You just, you play by the rules, you work hard. You know what I mean? Like in other words, he knows he's down in his luck and yeah, this is tough that I'm, I'm having to be a drifter and, and taking dirty jobs and I'm having to, you know, and they show him, really busting his butt and everything at the work site, but he believes in the system. And so that's kind of the point of the movie is to show him his gradual realization that no, the system is rigged. We're not going to get ahead. And why? Because the people running it, they're not like us. They're literally aliens. They are, do not have our interest at heart. You know what I mean? So I really like that dichotomy and, you know, to show his evolution and, and transformation so in terms of what the film is trying to do, like I think that's partly why it, why it works so well, and it's a it's a compelling story and, and keeps you you know keeps your interest. So yes, I would also give it a a seven. Like like Robert said, I toyed with an eight, but thought no, it's really just not that great of a movie, even though there's so much good about it. So I give it a seven. All right, well I get to be the a hole here, who um, I like the recollection of this movie and the premise and the the memories of it. Uh, from seeing it 20 years ago and watching it again, it actually kind of does bother me. Like, especially the scene, Robert, you brought up where he's supposed to go out and find this guy. And then all of a sudden the guy finds him. And the other thing that I didn't like was uh, the disjointedness of it. Like all of a sudden Rowdy Roddy Piper is now just going to go shooting cops and shooting people in banks and all this stuff. But just moments before he's this happy go lucky guy, believing in the system and working hard and getting, getting, uh, getting ahead in life, putting your head down. So I agree it's a, it's a evolution, but it was a bit too sudden and drastic for me. And, and I felt like some of the pieces just felt kind of crammed in there, like the 10 minute long fight scene. And yeah, it's cult classic -y and, and people refer to it and there's like uh, homages to it. And I think because it's so long, I think um, maybe in Family Guy, they did something related to it. Uh, not unlike they did with Roadhouse, uh, where Peter would uh, go kick something, go roadhouse. But anyway, it is it is super iconic. And I think that another part of it is Carpenter kind of has this visceral style, this like things that are um, uh, physical, like he, he does practical effects and, and practical uh, makeup and, and aliens and things like that. But he also sort of has this tinge of schlockiness referring back to like the 50s style of movie making of horror movies and things like that because it really surprised me to realize that this was you know 1988 and just 10 years later it's almost copied word for word by the wachowskis but in a very highly technically polished super high-end special effects 
great choreographed uh, fight scenes, a movie called The Matrix, which also has sunglasses, of course. Um, but, you know, you look at the fight scenes in this with Keith David and, and uh, Rowdy, and it's like, yeah, it's choreographed, but it, it looks uh, about as real as Rowdy Roddy Piper in the ring with Hulk Hogan. Um, so anyway, I maybe that's part of the charm, but I'm going to go with a six uh, pairs of sunglasses on this. Um, I like the concept, the premise, sort of like when we talked about The Purge a few weeks ago. I like the premise. It's like an interesting premise to explore. The execution just wasn't that great. And I feel bad sitting here in my high tower critiquing somebody who actually created something that uh, is iconic and great. And here I am just flapping my gums about it. But that's my that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So anyway, uh, any, any feedback on any of that? <laughs> All that apologizing for just a six out of 10. Still strong, still positive. Yeah. You're fine. Your, your opinion is fine, Daniel. It's all right. Yeah, I got the test. It was positive this time. Next time, it'll probably be negative. Who knows? <laughs> but each time, it'll be counted as a case. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> That's the way it is. So uh, what we're going to do next week, and Bob, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I think you stick around for just a, a little bit longer after this. But uh, next week, we're going to do a, a Libertarian Institute sandwich. Uh, last week, we had Kyle Anzalone uh, for The Beast. Uh, next week, we're going to have Pete Quinones on for JFK, who was very instrumental in bringing the meat of this Libertarian Institute uh, sandwich together, Bob Murphy, onto the show. There was a tweet uh, between right, yeah. and you and me, and uh, he encouraged you to come on. And I hope that he wasn't wrong in, in that, that, that you were okay with <laughs> the results of what has happened so far. We are not a highbrow show, uh, as I mentioned. But um, anyway, that's what we're going to be doing next week uh, is JFK for, um, for uh, yeah, it's almost the anniversary of, of him getting shot in Dallas. So that's, uh, that's why we're doing that one. And it's also another Kevin Costner flick, which we've been doing uh, almost exclusively Kevin Costner flicks with Pete uh, over the years, except for the one exception of Casablanca, which was a great great movie we did that earlier this summer yeah absolutely deservedly one of the all-time greats kevin costner was really young in that one right <laughs> <laughs> just a little baby just a baby <laughs> well, he was at the height of his powers right bodyguard and uh robin hood prince of thieves bull durham all around that area era yeah yeah jfk was in between print uh, dance of the wolves and those other things you just mentioned so yeah this is this is him at his highest peak. Right. And it's Oliver Stone. And I think we've got a uh, director's cut version, which the movie was long as it is. It's going to be even longer. Uh, the one we're going to watch and we're recording in just a couple of days. So that's going to be tough for me and my wife to get through it because we have to watch these things uh, in the evenings and we get really tired. We've been watching, um, speaking of they live, uh, Ancient Aliens, which is, uh, you know, got the guy with the crazy wild hair and like, that, that they refer to, you know, all these like uh, archaeological and hieroglyphic type, type things are actually like ancient aliens coming back to these people. And they were try trying to represent it the best way they could. Anyway, it's uh, it's interesting, but it also makes us tired after like 10 minutes and we fall asleep. So it takes us a long time. Let, to get let me just mention, if you guys like Kevin Coster, did you ever, you know, the Rich Eisen show? E -I -S -E -N? Yeah, PN guy, right? Or back in the day. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I just on YouTube. I was on a rabbit hole. I was looking. I don't even know how it came up, but it was. There's a bunch of clips of Kevin Costner on that guy's talk show, talking about big movies like you know, oh, who who is the biggest actor you've ever been in? Movie? And he's like, oh, Gene Hackman, and da, da, da. And he's like does impressions of like Sean Connery on set talking to Kevin Costner, you know. And so Kevin Costner's doing impressions of. Anyway, you might want to go look that up. It's, okay. It's fun. Yeah, it sounds interesting. We'll definitely check that. I, I found a list of uh, his. 42 of his movie appearances ranked in order of goodness to badness. And uh, JFK is number two on that list of goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, Waterworld is uh, <laughs> way down <laughs> as is the postman, which uh, we, we, we've done both of those with Pete. But uh, anyway, um, everyone who wants to support our show, you can go to lastnighters.com slash Patreon. You can send some dollars our way. Fiat currency, we, we still accept it uh, for the time being, at least until the, um, the new uh, digital currency, the Amero, uh, <laughs> comes into play. Um, and then check out uh, Bob Murphy's show at bobmurphyshow.com, and we will have links to that and also your episode on, on They Live. Uh, I, I think that could be considered almost a companion piece 
to this discussion and I would reference people to, to maybe check that out first. So, you know, now that we're at the end, pause, go listen to that and then come and finish for the last like minute or so of this. Uh, that's how we do it here. Anyways, uh, check out our Patreon, check out Bob Murphy's show and check out JFK next week with Pete Quinones of the Freeman Beyond the Wall podcast. And uh, we will say goodnight from last night, everyone. Peace out. All right, and just continuing for a few more minutes on the actual Anarchy podcast, Bob, you've been great uh, as a guest, and uh, we'd love to have you back sometime if, if you're willing to do so. Uh, I do have one kind of question, and it's sort of you talked about at the end of your episode on They Live, episode mm -hmm. 50 of Bob Murphy Show. Uh, you talk about like what to do, how to how to move forward, what Rowdy Roddy Piper should have done, and that was you know to like find people uh, and educate and and grow. Uh, sort of organically that way. But there's a couple of issues, I think, and that is, you know, the NPCs we talked about earlier with the Michael Malice situation, mm -hmm. like there are a high proportion of people who will never, <laughs> never get it. Um, and we have also seen they, and they live, uh, now hold the levers of power in media, entertainment, social media, and more to a point where they're purging and censoring dissent. Uh, an example would be the Tim, Tim Pool with uh, Michael Malice and Alex Jones being a recent example. So you have done an interview with a zombie. So what would you, you were the zombie. Um, how would you, in the climate that we're in, where oh, there's all the censorship and, and limitations of social media reach and things like that, like what do you see as a path forward uh, to improve the situation? Sure, so it's, on the one hand, it's weird that, um, you know, the arguments about, oh, you know, if, if you get kicked off Twitter or, or YouTube, then you, you're basically a, a hermit. And how can you possibly be expected to reach anybody? And, you know, that's why the government needs to regulate them as a public utility. And when these things didn't even exist, whatever, 20 years ago, I, I got to go to check my timeline. But you know what I mean? So it's, it is weird to me that, you know, like the, now like the biggest scandal in the world is getting kicked off of Facebook or whatever, when that wasn't even a thing that long ago. So there is that element that it's more, you know, we have these tools to be able to come to reach each other so well and that, you know, it's now we're, we're having you know one hand tied behind our back. So just to, to keep that, that in perspective, that still having the internet is this amazing vehicle by which we can, you know, get, get the word out to people. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know that I have anything pr profound to say on that, except um, I, I suppose to say things like be very careful. Don't, for example, conservatives don't run to the government to regulate social media or whatever, thinking that's the way to do it, because clearly that's just going to mean that when someone tries to set up alternatives to Twitter or whatever, that now because of the government's going to have more regulatory authority, they're going to quash that as well. Right. So that, like the, the idea that you would turn to the government in order to ensure free speech and that the Rothbardian perspective can still get a fair hearing, get, you know, give me, but that that's insane to me that, that some people are, are, are dabbling with that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I talk to people that they're, they're trying to develop alternative platforms. I suppose to people who do have a platform, like we're all contributing to it. So like, I'm when, when Facebook just recently demonetized the Babylon B for, you know, some completely ludicrous, I forget the exact, it'd be a better story if I could remember. I don't know if you guys know what the particular video I, was or, or story. Yeah, which one it was but yeah it was so it's something awesome. ridiculous it was, like, it was like the worst one i'd ever heard of in terms of give me a break you guys know that's not what they meant N not a single person on earth was thought that was a real story give me a break and, and, and also too in the terms of it it would be inciting violence against the babylon bees people against christians or something you know what i mean it wasn't even like someone who took it the wrong way might have gone and attacked a democrat so like the whole thing was crazy but they were saying, you know, it promotes violence or something. So we're demonetizing the Babylon Bee, which just, you know, decapitates them. It's like that's part of the, the way that they stay in business. So I'm moving my, I have like a supporting listeners group. I'm going to, we're going to move off of that because I realized, no, by me being in there, I'm contributing to us all being on Facebook. So I'm saying little things like that that are inconvenient. Because why are we all on Facebook? Because we're all on Facebook, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I'm saying, yeah. like, 
like, yeah, we can't necessarily stop certain things from happening, but we it'd be like if there was a bar that we all hung out in and the owner not only got up every Thursday and said, hey, you know, I, I love Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, but went around, you know, like stabbing some of your friends in the arm with a knife. And we, like, we, and we just kept going there and buying beer and drinking and be like, man, I, I wish he would stop stabbing us, but I want to see all my friends. Like at some point you would need to, on principle, say no. Like you have to be a law against stabbing people. <laughs> there should be, yeah. So, so the, anyway, th that's what I mean. That like I'm realizing, it, it, or, or or if what what has happened now isn't enough for you, I would just challenge everybody: come up with something to say. Okay, if these platforms ever did this, then I would stop. You know, I would move my account somewhere. I would just not do social media. You know what I mean? Like, there, but there has to be something in principle. But if your position is no, no matter what they do, even if we're all in gulags, but I still want to get my tweet out and see how many hearts I get, <laughs> that would be kind of crazy. So um, I guess that that's what I would say is that it, at the very least, we can try to do things to, you know, to stop this, how much power they have by by regulating it or by, you know, the, the powers that be. In other words, bec the reason it's such a big deal to get booted off Twitter is because we don't have enough competing websites right now. So let's try to get those going. Right. Yeah. So when I am in the real camp, uh, I will tweet out, avenge me like uh, <laughs> the dad in Red Dawn. Right. <laughs> All right, Robert, you're, you're about to say something. We should probably wind it down. No, I was just going to agree with Bob. Vote with your feet. Get off. If 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 it's uh, if you're upset with with what's happening, then you know, put your money where your mouth is and give them that market signal. Be principled, and mm -hmm. yeah, and let's let's form a cool kids club somewhere else, and people will come to the cool kids club. Don't They'll follow the cool kids. If I could just jump into what you were talking about the NPCs, and so you're right. The goal is not that, oh, we're going to convince 100% of the people to think or 92%, but the vast bulk of people are just going to do whatever is, you know, is, is the dominant thing anyway. You know what I mean? So it's it's not that it's like my business partner, I have a, a slogan of building the 10%, you know, saying if we could just get 10% who are really committed, that would be enough because the rest of the, of the masses, they just kind of go along with whatever the thing is. So, yeah, and people don't like have a loyalty to Facebook. They love the content, right? They right. love the people that are on it. They don't, they don't care yeah. about Mark Zuckerberg. I've seen a mass exodus so far of like uh, libertarian and and uh, conservative leaning people, like to places like Parler and MeWe. Uh, I started making transition to MeWe, so you can find mm -hmm. me on there, uh, Daniel Elwood on MeWe, and uh, I'm getting less and less uh, active on Facebook, though it is still like how I connect with, you know, most of our guests and friends and people I've met through like Tom Woods group and all that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's days are numbered, I think. And uh, they are shooting themselves in the foot. Um, I don't know what the end result's going to be, but it's becoming more and more of a, an isolated echo chamber of progressivism. And uh, I don't think that's going to be that interesting of a place. Um, <laughs> once all the cool kids leave, like Robert, you were saying. Yeah, I, you could go in there to to just like what Bob does when he subscribes to some leftists on YouTube just to see what they're talking about, see what they're thinking. But, you know, you're not going there to interact and really necessarily change minds. Maybe. Right. Well, discussion is not really permitted on there anymore. So that's makes it a little harder. But anyway, uh, Bob, thanks again for, for being our guest. It's been a, a great discussion. And I will refer people again to your episode on They Live, Bob Murphy Show slash 50. And uh, they should check out the other stuff you do. Uh, you are very prolific and uh, a really good dude. So thanks again for coming on. I hope you had a good time. Yeah, this was great. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Bob. All right. And uh, audience, thank you, guys. We'll be back next week talking about JFK with uh, the great Pete Quinones of the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast. And until then, uh, maximum freedom. Peace out. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do